Uh, welcome everyone for this ad hoc and special seminar today. So uh, we have the great honor, uh, this is the, the right word to use, the, the great honor to have with us uh, Professor John Dick. Um, we just took the opportunity to host him, yeah. <laughs> in fact, we're kidnapping him from another meeting. Uh, Professor Dick, he's a senior scientist and Canada Research Chair in stem cell biology at the Prince, uh, Prince Margaret Cancer Center, Professor of Molecular Genetics, a university professor at the University of Toronto. I, I like this, the following sentence. He's recognized for identifying and characterizing normal leukemia human hematopoietic stem cells. That, that I think explains a little bit the, the CV of, of Professor Dick. Because we work with these cells all the time, but who, who characterizes these cells? That's, that's another question, no? And, and this is uh, the work of, of, of John Dick. So in this area, he has provided evidence for, the, of course, the cancer stem cell hypothesis before, and new ways to purify these cells, to isolate these cells. And this work has been well recognized. It's not only in the scientific books, the scientific articles, but in books. No? It means that he's going to test the, the test of time, no? this, this kind of sentence. So he's a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, Society of London, of the US National Academy of Medicine, Thomas Price Award, Klopp's Memorial Award, ACR Scholar, and many other uh, lists. And recently, in this uh, 22, he has been laureate of the Ca Ca Canada Gerner International Award. This is a very prestigious award. And he's here, as always I said, for his science, to explain his science, not his awards, that there are many. And the title of his talk is going to be Development of a hierarchy-based classification system in human, human leukemia. John? Well, it's a real pleasure to be here. I've been in Barcelona a lot, but I always stay in the city, and I didn't realize there was this, uh, you know, center of excellence in the mountains. Mm -hmm. So, the, you know, the taxi driver was driving, and the roads got narrower and narrower, and I was wondering, where are we going? And uh, I arrived here, and it's this fantastic uh, location. So I'm delighted to spend time, and, and perhaps it will be the beginning of uh, the beginning of future uh, mm -hmm. visits where I can uh, come up here. So no, that would be that would be very nice. Okay, let me just timer going here. Okay, so what do I, I've changed my talk uh, title a little bit, but what I want to do uh, in this talk is to really give you a perspective uh, of, uh, well, the broad theme is, you know, what does a stem cell look like uh, and uh, why does it go bad? So I'll talk about these three themes. Uh, the background is a little bit, uh, just, just a little bit of background, and then I'll focus on the two bottom uh, slides. And I think a few of you might have been at the seminar that I just gave at the conference uh, uh, in the city, and uh, so you'll be bored for the first little bit, but I added some other things at the end that uh, I didn't talk about there because I have a bit more time. So the beginning part, I'm going to talk about the work that uh, these three people did. So Stephanie is a senior uh, person in the lab. She's an affiliate scientist in our institute, and he's an MD-PhD student, and Mertaz, or Taz, is a, is a postdoc. And this is a brand new story, still emerging, so I'm going to give you a work in progress, uh, but I think it's a really interesting uh, work in progress that has a lot of links to aging, homeopoiesis, pre-leukemia. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, so it's, it's a very new story. So just to, to orient you, so, you know, we figured out that you could assay human stem cells by watching what they do, and what they do is not repopulate a human, nobody wants to volunteer for my experiments, but repopulate a mouse. And with that, we were able to, over the course of 25 years, figure out what's the cell look like that has the ability to regenerate in a mouse. And so this uh, scheme that you see up here, is that my mouse, I think is, yeah, there it is. So this scheme up here came from, you know, repopulation studies in the mouse. This is one done by Lisa Lorente uh, a few years ago, where we took these various sorted populations of cells, put them in a mouse, and all these three populations are multi-lineage. So that's not a feature of a stem cell. Uh, they all will repopulate. So that's not a feature of a stem cell. It's just that these cells do it for a short period of time, not, not plotted. Uh, the short term will do it, but they also don't last too long. Uh, and the long term will do it permanently. And the key is if you do a serial transplant, the canonical hallmark self renewal is only lying in this top population. So there's a, we can distinguish these different populations. So advances in technology finally, you know, have led, oops, advances in technology have finally led us to gain some understanding uh, of the behavior of the cells, and particularly at the top end of the system. We've been very interested in how a cell moves from dormancy into activation. One of the key papers that Elisa published some years ago was 
that it takes a, a long-term stem cell six hours longer to exit G0 and enter the cell cycle compared to a short-term stem cell. And that was uh, guided by CDK6 was the key marker, which actually is very important for us to distinguish cells which are in dormancy versus cells that are beginning to think about being activated. Uh, into cell cycle. So, you know, activation is a process that takes some time. And we're very interested in that transition. So these are, these four papers here, I would call them, I'm just gonna summarize them very briefly. Uh, you can read them, they're all published, but they're our COVID babies. So <laughs> they're all papers published from 2020 onwards uh, that wouldn't have gotten published with that speed without it being COVID because the guys in the lab basically couldn't keep doing experiments and we had to finally finish up writing these papers. So, you know, the key experiments were the ones really shown here where we showed that uh, the properties of a stem cell are very distinct uh, from the cells just downstream. So a long-term dormant stem cell is different than a cell which is just starting to be activated. Beautiful work of Laura Garcia Pratt, uh, a local. Uh, she was a student, amazing student with Pura uh, Minos and uh, had showed that uh, this exit from dormancy is governed by TFEB, which is a major regulator of uh, autophagy, the unfolded protein response, and the endolysosomal program, such that, uh, you know, like many people in the field, you know, uh, dormancy is not the absence of proliferation. Dormancy is an active program. And one of those active programs is very high levels of lysosomes. We can actually sort cells just based on lysosomal activity into a, a dormant or out of a dormant and, or activated state. And uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful paper. And then we also have showed over the years that the stress signaling is completely different in a stem cell. So stem cells have a much lower threshold for killing themselves if they have any kind of proteostatic damage uh, that, than, uh, than the cell just downstream. Uh, and I think these provides an interesting selection environment for, you know, oncogenic mutations, uh, you know, driven by ATF4 and the classic unfolded protein response. Uh, this story uh, of uh, just published a little while ago from uh, 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 Kirsten Kaufman, uh, where we had actually taken what we thought was a pure population of long-term hematopoietic stem cells, but we realized there's actually two kinds of cells within the long-term, what we thought was a pure population. They can be distinguished based on CD112 high and 112 low. That is essentially elaborating a program underpinned by a new gene called INCA1, PAC4, uh, H4, uh, K16 acetylation marks, and SIRT1. You have to read the paper, it's kind of a complicated mechanism, but the key is that interestingly, what happens is when you transplant these cells, the one population takes a while to get going, and then it finally contributes to the graft. Whereas the other population gets going very quickly, uh, but then it goes away. So the activation quickly in the face of a transplant is actually, it comes at, the, at a cost for one population, but the other population can resist that. We call it a latency. And that latency has the property of preserving stem cell function in the face of a transplant. And this actually, these kinetics follow very closely the gene therapy trials, particularly the gene tracking trials that were reported by the group in Italy. Uh, in, in gene therapy patients where you could track stem cell behavior. And in this one, which I'm gonna come back to, <clears throat> we carried out the first really high resolution uh, insight into this dormant and activated stem cell state uh, with uh, ATAC, single cell ATAC, high C on a model and then low C on these actual cells. So we know a lot about the 3D chromatin conformation changes between when a dormant cell starts to become activated. So again, this is before cell cycle, but it's starting to be activated. So there's a set of 280 sites bound by CTCF that are open in, in the dormant cell that have to close down uh, to repress in order for them to exit and, and to uh, enter the, the more activated state. And that provides an interesting signature that we can use uh, in the subsequent data. So, um, so we know a lot now about the behavior, not everything of course, but, but we, we, with technology, we finally have the ability to finally use the primary human cell as an experimental model. Uh, and you know, not just rely on, on the mouse models. So like everybody, we're moving into the single cell world. Uh, one of the issues in the blood field with single cell data is that much of the data that is uh, available for mapping the atlas, you know, comes from whole, whole, uh, whole, whole, uh, whole blood or whole bone marrow sequencing. And, and there's always a little you know, label here that says stem cell. But the question is, what is, you know, how many of these rare long-term stem cells or short-term or MPP, you know, land in that window? 
And the, because the problem is that all of these uh, samples are uh, the, the, the frequency of these cells is, you know, one or 10 or, you know, maybe even a hundred sometimes, but it's a very low population. So we actually don't know what the quality is. And so Andy has uh, taken onwards where he, we basically made a combined uh, mapping where we've taken all the data that we have, including this uh, population of CD34, which is more enriched for the primitive population to create a more balanced map. And then as I'll show you in a second, we have these you know, beautiful labels now where we can uh, <clears throat> you know, map from HSC down the sort of lymphoid pathway, the myeloerythroid, and then the, uh, the myeloid pathway here. And Lara Garcia Pratt in unpublished work really uh, titrated down the B cell lineage pathway here. And so we actually have data we're just putting together on the upper end of the uh, B cell lineage from the sort of LMPP, MLP down to pre-pro and all the, the, the other downstream B cell populations of which there wasn't a good reference map. It's all coupled with a lot of functional data that underlies the, the single cell data that, that, that is represented here. And so this is just an example of, you know, how well does it work? So we've asked ourselves, well, you know, if we take other studies, other data where we've actually purified cells, we've taken, you know, uh, gene expression, we've done functional studies to so know the frequency of a long-term cell, its behavior, so phenotype and function. And we take those kinds of cells, where do they land? Well, they land exactly in the window that we call an HSC. So now we have a lot of confidence that if we have an unknown data set and we see cells landing in this window, we know that they must be stem cells. Or another way you can put it is we can use informatics to essentially purify stem cells out of a mixed population. And, you know, and this is just the data that, that, that verifies that the other components of how this works, you know, works very well in terms of the different pathways and how they project uh, onto this uh, map. So this map has become very useful for the data I'm going to show you about in a minute. So we've been interested in aging. So that's this, the blood system. So what is it, how does it change, right? Most of our work has been done on cord blood. Uh, you know, bone marrow doesn't engraft particularly well in mice, but, you know, now with the new models, we can get better and graft them to the bone marrow. And this is just our first study where we started to capture a few samples in the 20s, a few samples in middle age, a few samples in the elderly. And uh, this is just phenotype, but you can see the phenotype of that long-term stem cell is going up massively. And it's actually expected from the mouse data, right? Most data shows that phenotypic stem cells increase, but then they become bias, they, they, don't, they don't function quite normally. And you know, we, we have a lot of functional data that underpins this, but just to say the blood system is changing uh, with aging. And uh, when we've been looking at this data, we have access to this data, so we've done multi-ome analysis on that data, so combined ATAC uh, RNA sequencing <coughs> on this set of samples. <coughs> Pardon me. What Alex has done is we've used N uh, NMF to uh, <coughs> generate unbiased signatures Sorry, I've been talking too much the last three days. To create unbiased signatures of these cells, <clears throat> and what you can see is that there is a signature, an NMF signature here, which is uh, very, which is which is high in the young uh, bone marrow in the blue here, but it's low, uh, it, you know, it's low in or it, 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 there's a here and it's, and it's low in this uh, old population. Conversely, there's a set, a set of signatures which is high uh, in the old, but negative in the uh, young cells. And so this is cluster two and cluster one. And if you just look at it, you can see that the cluster, you know, one is uh, is low in a young cell and high in the old, and the other, vice versa. It's, it's uh, uh, yeah, the, the young signature is high and then low in the old. So it, it seems to behave, you know, as one would expect. So the question is, well, what does this signature represent? So I told you earlier <clears throat> that when we carried out this uh, work, we had created a, an ATAC signature of this long-term dormant stem cell. And that's what the signature looks like when it's projected onto these, onto these bone marrow stem cells. You can see that, that this is where that signature lies in this quadrant. And if you look in that age signature, it falls over that signature. So as these cells are aging, they're essentially generating a, a signature which is highly representative of a dormant long-term uh, stem cell. Conversely, the young signature is spread out a little bit more differently. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it does bleed a little into this window, but you can see it's much more present here. And this is this activated signature in normal cord blood. And when we ask where is the young, that's where the young is, is, is underlying. So young is more like an activated poised uh, stem cell. So there are features then that seem to uh, distinguish across aging. But when we start to look at our you know, pure signature, this is you know, 5,000 or 4,000, purified long-term HSCs, they all land there. And we look at this data, 
Um, <clears throat> what we realize is that it's not a homogeneous population. So by the pathway analysis, there's a set of cells here, which is you know, very stem-like, it's a cell cycle. The things that we would all accept are, are the stem cell programs. Uh, but you can see that there's this ER stress inflammation pathway down here. And when you look, you know, it's very enriched for NF-kappa B, very enriched for the ER stress uh, pathway genes. So there's something, you know, there's some heterogeneity in this population. And so God is thinking about, you know, uh, inflammation. And, and we know, you know, this is an emerging area and there are papers beginning in the mouse system where, of course, we know that there is, you know, immune response within the immune cells, right, memory T cells and so forth. Uh, but the idea of this trained immunity is starting to be uh, recognized in the mouse where hematopoietic stem cells, when they get an acute inflammation, they get pushed uh, into cycle uh, in order to differentiate. It's an emergency response. But of course, if it's an acute, the cells will go back and recover. Uh, but then the question is, well, what happens uh, if you have a persistent inflammation and then you really start to damage the stem cells and become very myeloid biased? This goes on, oncogenes, you know, this is the beginning steps of oncogenesis. Uh, and of course, these are the steps of aging as well, right? So this is data from, you know, review from the mouse. So the question is, what about the human? I mean, how does, what, what do we know about human cells and inflammation, inflammatory processes? The answer is we don't know very much. So we carried out this experiment, we take cord blood cells, so very, you know, uh, young population of cells, transplant them into mice, wait for engraftment to happen. Then we've done with one dose of LPS or one dose with, with uh, uh, TNF. 16 hours later, we look and there's a marked reduction in the graft, just what you would expect from an acute response. If you wait for another couple of weeks, the, bar the marrow is just completely recovered. Again, what you would expect. So then in this particular experiment, we ended up doing a second hit uh, of, uh, of um, uh, uh, treatment. Uh, and then we waited two and, a half, uh, two and a half months, so 20 weeks later. And we looked 20 weeks later, uh, there seems to be a memory of this prior exposure that these cells had because there's a persistent reduction uh, in the engraftment. And I'm not showing you, but persistent reduction in stem cell potential uh, in these cells. So there's some kind of a memory. So what we did is we ended up doing multi-ohm again on these samples at that time point. So it requires a large number of mice. You have to purify the rare stem cells out of a group of mice. And so we did that, did the multi-ohm analysis. And we mapped it using our atlas, and we saw that there was a stem cell population. But because we had the combined embedding, um, ATAC is actually a better indicator of cell state when cells are very similar uh, than gene expression differences. So combining them was very powerful. And so we took to these stem cell population, we realized that the second stem cell population uh, projected in a different place. And it seemed to, it seemed to be changing, it, you know, be, be moved further out depending on the insult that the cells got. So this was very odd. This stem cell population, you know, is very similar to the one we studied before. We could do, you know, a version of, uh, you know, velocity or pseudo time, and, you know, it's connected to homeostatic blood development. But this one is unusual. It's off to the side. And so what was it? And so when you look and do a comparison of these, we uh, did, of course, single cell sequencing, and we looked, and it turns out that there is a distinct uh, difference between the, we call it HSC2, from the homeostatic HSC. Uh, and if you look at the TNF, there's even more activity post-exposure of TNF, remember two and a half months earlier, uh, in that HSC2 population. If you look at the level of ATAC, there's actually a lot more happening. ATAC is really exposing more peaks uh, in the HSC2, it has very little activity in the HSC1. And uh, when you look by transcription factor, you know, integrate the data and you look at TF binding sites, you can see that there's really a lot of binding sites that are opening up by exposure to TNF. And I'm, I'll show you on a different slide, but what's up here is AP1, you know, FOS, June, uh, you know, TF you know, kappa B, the classic inflammatory modules that are driving um, this, uh, this response, at, but at the stem cell level. This is just an independent way mining TF targets from uh, from the RNA sequencing and similarly come up with the same uh, pattern of targets. So just to summarize then, we think HSC1 is homeostatic, the stem cell we all have come to love and know, uh, but then there's this new stem cell that we've uncovered. Uh, and it seems to be, uh, first of all, it's, it's very low in cord blood. In the control, PBS treated mice, that's when we start to see this population. So there's something about the transplant setting, which is actually uh, uh, expanding this population of cells. Uh, and then that's the population which is also ultra sensitive to the single insults of, um, of this. And so it seems then like this is a cell that has memory of an exposure a few months earlier. 
And so that's, okay, they have a signature. Well, what does it look like? Because there are, other, there are other memory signatures. And of course, the best study memory signatures are in T cells. And this is an especially beautiful paper where they had taken volunteers uh, and immunized them with the yellow fever vaccine. It's a very potent vaccine. And they fed them deuterium, so tritiated water, or not tritiated, but heavy water uh, for a month. And then that ended up, you know, obviously looking at the cells that were proliferating in the face of the vaccination. They captured cells then that uh, had responded. Uh, and then they waited for almost a decade. And because they were heavy water labeled, they could actually find these memory T cells. I think waiting for 13 years is a good definition of a memory cell. And then they end up coming up with a, a gene expression difference of these cells uh, in this memory category. So we ask ourselves, how does our signature, our HSC memory signature, relate to this T cell memory signature? We'll look at the GSEA, massive enrichment for our memory signature and this T cell memory signature. And it's, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, you can see that in the, in the uh, slide shown here as well. It's not, the homeostatic one doesn't change at all, uh, but there's a high enrichment for the, uh, the, the homeostatic one. And so we, we created uh, this, this signature, I already told you about that, and we did it the other way around. We asked, how does our signature uh, enrich for the memory T cell signature? And you can see you know, the very high p-values and it really uh, enriches. So the, it, the signatures work in both directions. Memory T cell is enriched in ours, ours is enriched in that one. And so you know, this is a mouse, is this relevant in any sort of way? Uh, and so we had the opportunity to collaborate with Stephen Josefowitz from New York, and he has data, some published data, but it's in a bioarchive paper, where they have uh, stem cells taken a few months after patients had COVID. And these are patients who've had severe COVID. So it's after their recovery, but they've had severe COVID. So you have healthy controls. You have other patients who are in the ICU full, and, and been, been recovered from their ICU exposure, uh, but they didn't have inflammatory processes. And then you had uh, patients who are post-COVID, you can see there's an enrichment of our signature, and by you know GSEA, there's a marked uh, enrichment of the signature in this real-life setting. So this is giving us some confidence that the signature is actually having some kind of a meaning. Now, the other thing we wanted to ask is, well, what about aging? How does it relate to aging? So I told you we already have that data I showed you earlier where there's an increase in phenotypic stem cells. Well, it turns out it's not an increase in the homeostatic signature, it's actually an increase in the HSC memory signature. So you can see, compared to cord blood, there's this real marked increase, uh, particularly to the middle age. Interestingly, it goes down a little bit in the 70-year-olds, which we don't know any explanation uh, for. It's still higher than, uh, than it is in the young. Um, it, you know, if you might recall the paper published a few months ago from Peter Campbell and Elisa Lorente in Nature, where they had have been uh, counting stem cells in people during aging, and they showed that there's wide diversity of stem cell numbers, 50, 100,000 stem cells, until the age of 60. But if you're over the age of 70, that compresses down to 10, 12, 15 stem cells. And we wonder whether that, there's something related to that, but we, we don't know. And this is just another data set of uh, pediatric and adult. There's one other data set we have, which is also highly concordant. So it looks like the signature is actually happening in real people. There is an increase in this new stem cell population uh, as we uh, as we age, and so that then we we'll put those things together and ask, you know, how does this relate to clonal hemopoiesis? So just to introduce clonal hemopoiesis, this is our entry into clonal hemopoiesis many years ago. There are students here, and I just want to give you this is a good lesson for students. So this is this is why you just do experiments. You don't always know where you're going, uh, but always keep your eyes open because you might be going in a better direction than you think you're going. Uh, so this was an experiment that Lorenz, so Lorenz Solution, when he came to my lab, he brought genomics, he was trained in population genetics and, and so forth, and he really brought genetics into my lab. Uh, and we were doing an experiment, we were looking at diagnosis, we had 12 cases of AML patients who had a sample at diagnosis and the day they walked into the clinic and a sample when they relapsed. And we were going to do targeted sequencing and ask where does relapse come from? That turned into a beautiful paper, but I'm not going to talk about that here. But what happened was, this was early days of targeted sequencing, and uh, they had done the first analysis. We had 103, you know, good AML, you know, uh, genes. Uh, but in fact, the, the company that made the targeted panel had made errors on two or three of them, and we needed to redo it. Uh, and so this was just a, the preliminary first run. Can we do targeted sequencing in Toronto? Our genome center didn't have a very good pipeline for doing it. And so Lorraine was looking at this data manually and he came to me and he said, you know, it's worked really great for a hundred, 
of the 101 genes, but there's one gene, there's three patients, which is really weird because the T cells have the identical mutation as the blasts. It happened to be DMT3A, three patients with DMT3A. Initially we thought, oh well, you know, we just contaminated our T cell population with sorting with some leukemia blasts. But we convinced ourselves that that wasn't the case. Uh, and it's because the leukemia had an MPM1 mutation and a DMT3 mutation. The, the BAF here was, you know, 0.5%, maybe 1% uh, for DMT3A, but it was absolutely zero for uh, MPM1. So that proved it couldn't be contamination. So the only obvious explanation is there had to have been a common ancestor. But of course, this was a common ancestor that could have existed 30 years ago. And of course, the only common ancestor to a T cell, uh, which, uh, you know, and, and, a, and a myeloid cell, of course, is a multipotent stem cell. And so the question is, does that common ancestor still exist today? So we just thought, well, you know, this, this leukemia sample in the biobank has 80, 90% of cells blast, but there's 10 or 20% normal. Let's sort into that. And we sorted and we found stem cells and other populations. And then we just asked the question, can we find the NMT3A and can we find leukemia mutations? And so if you look at the blasts, of course, they have two. This is not quantitative. This is just a, a binary outcome. But you can see all the stem cell populations had were positive. And in fact, all many of the downstream, including the, 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 the mature populations, are actually positive, but just for dnmt 3 a The key was the VAF was 24%, right? So half of the blood of this person, the day they walked into the clinic, was coming from one stem cell that had dnmt 3 a And the leukemia had dnmt 3 a So it was like... My gosh, you know, we've serendipitously realized that we've, we've answered important questions. What's the first hit? That leukemia had three or four hits. The first hit was DMT3A. It must have happened in a stem cell. That stem cell still exists the day uh, the person walked into the clinic and it had clonally expanded. So we know something about what the first stem cell, what the first gene did. You know, it's sort of a, a completely, um, you know, serendipitous result. And so it raised these questions. We thought, I remember we were just, we were so excited. We said, you know what, if we, if we sample the blood of people in the general population, uh, we're, we're gonna find a few people every, uh, you know, every thousand people, maybe we'll find somebody who actually has a leukemia patient and that person will be you know, uh, on, on, on the pathway towards leukemia. Uh, and so we started to collect data or we started to think about how we're gonna access public data sets. And of course, then you could ask the question, you know, how, how frequent is this? How long does it take? We thought it was going to be ultra rare. We published that paper at the beginning of 2014. And of course, by the end of 2014, there was a mass of papers from Ben Ebert, Sid J. Swole, uh, you know, uh, Stephen Carroll and others, where they had been mining, you know, human peripheral blood samples for all kinds of things, you know, uh, genome GWAS studies for diabetes and schizophrenia and whatever that just happened to have blood. And they sequenced them for leukemia mutations and, and realized that actually, this idea that there are people walking around who don't have leukemia, have picked up blood leukemia mutations is incredibly common, like more than 10, 20% of people, and it goes up with aging. I mean, it was sort of shocking, right? Um, because uh, that, that it was so frequent, because we know from the data that, you know, leukemia is ultra rare. So it seems like two kind, there's two kinds of clonal hemophysis. The one kind, which is very common, and it seems to be benign, and another kind, which seems to predict that somebody's going to go on and get leukemia. And the question is, how are you going to find one versus the other? Uh, and so what we had done then was we ended up contacting the people at, at Epic. The large cohort started in the 90s, 500,000 Europeans. And, uh, and we asked them, so sometime after enrollment, had anybody gotten AML? And they said, yes, we have about 100 people who have AML. And we said, great. And this is when, you know, the time after enrollment, they got it. Uh, and we asked for four to one match controls, so matched in every way possible. We later on collaborated with George Vassiliou, who had his own data set in Britain, and uh, Loran led this uh, story. And essentially, we did targeted sequencing on these many uh, patient samples, a couple of 1,700 samples. And we identified four different things that were important. One is, if you're going to go on, you know, remember, all these people are normal the day we get their blood sample, but sometime in the next decade, uh, some of them are going to get leukemia, and that set has pre or has a clonal expansion, or has has ARCH uh, or CH uh, more frequently uh, than the control. Now you can also see here the control is giving us a much higher number than the original JSWAL, but it's because we sequence much deeper, and that's where we're finding them. And then the other thing is, well, what are the other differences? Well, uh, you get more mutations. So if you are just have benign, you only have one mutation, 
And it's typically in TED2 XXL uh, and MT3A explains 95% of ARCH. But if you're going to go on and get leukemia, you have two mutations. Uh, and, you pick, and you pick up these additional mutations one decade earlier uh, than if you're a control. And the spectrum of mutations is quite different, right? You have splicing mutations, p53, uh, and so forth. The other thing is if you look at the kind of mutation, right? You can have mutations in you know, various places in DMT3 or various places in TET2. But if you ask, are they cosmic? Are they oncogenic? Known oncogenic mutations, way more in the subset who are going to go on and get leukemia versus those that are not going to get leukemia even if they've been followed for 30 years. And then the BAF is higher as well. And so, you know, in that paper, we built a model that was actually quite predictive of patients who are going to go on and get, you know, leukemia. And I think that this, there's a strategy that, you know, we're trying to work on and others to try to see if we can, uh, you know, screen at least population at risk. I don't think anybody wants to screen the general population, but at least people who are at risk. Uh, that, that I think is a good strategy. So pre-leukemia is, is an important aspect. And the question is, what is it about pre-leukemia and how does it relate to our stem cell? And so we, I'll show you the data in a moment, but this is the first data that we have. This is from Ellie um, Iridi uh, Papiatru, where she had taken an IPS generated model of pre-leukemia. So it's a generated model, uh, knocked in these various genes, then uh, uh, differentiated the cells to hematopoietic cells and asked how are they different? And if you look at the modules, ASXL, the main module here is, you know, inflammatory processes. Even with two hits, it's inflammatory processes. And if you look at the hits here, these are the hits that we have in our so high similarity between our HSC memory signature and uh, the first hits that are coming in in, in, uh, in uh, ASXL, or in, uh, in pre-leukemia. So now we've actually, these are the data that's just come in in the last week, actually. So we've been collaborating with Press Bias at Oxford. They've been doing targeted sequencing, so RNA sequencing with genotyping. Um, and what they have then is a set of patients uh, which have clonal hemopoiesis. And because they do this clonally, they do it on colonies, we can identify stem cells that are mutant and stem cells that are wild type within that patient. And then we can compare them to stem cells that are from a patient who doesn't have CH and ask what happens to our signature, where is it? Well, our signature is, oops, okay. So our signature is, this is, the, this is the enrichment of the memory signature, massively enriched in the 3A patient, massively enriched in the TEP patient compared to the wild type person. And if you ask the question the other way, uh, it, it looks like the, uh, uh, there's also uh, the, uh, uh, the, so that's, that's the CH mutant HSC. So that's focusing on that, that cell versus uh, that cell. But if you actually look at the wild type, remember this patient has a BAF of about uh, 10 or 20%. So 80% of the stem cells are wild type. But if you look at the wild type stem cell, it's actually highly enriched. So this is really interesting, right? It means that there's a cell non-autonomous feature which is uh, causing this HSC memory signature to be present in both of these, in, in both stem cells in this patient who has clonal hemopoiesis. And it's very interesting to figure out, you know, what's the chicken and what's the egg here? And, uh, you know, how, why is this uh, happening? What's the selective environment? And if you just look how significant is this, so what Andy did was he made, he basically took every gene set that exists in the literature, right? Every hallmark, every cell hallmark uh, and, and, and uh, pathway gene set, 7,000 of them, and asked how our HSC memory rates in relation to 7,000 sets. There it is up there. I mean, massive enrichment to, uh, you know, to, to predict this, uh, this, uh, this correlation. So it's a highly correlated. And then lastly, uh, to finish this part off, if you just look in annual samples, uh, so this is just, I'll show you later what this projection is, but these are, uh, this is, if we take just AML patients, 1,000 AML patients, uh, and you just plot them based on their genotype, and you can see down at the bottom here, there's this, and, and what, you, what I'm plotting here is the HSC memory uh, correlation. Uh, with patients that have uh, these particular genotypes. And you can see there's a whole set here of uh, AXXL bearing tumors that are highly enriched for the HSC memory uh, signature compared to you know, other kinds of drivers. Okay, uh, all right, so that's the normal side and a little bit of you know, how we might go from pre-leukemia so to, uh, uh, you know, to, to leukemia. So let's talk about leukemia. All right, so I'm not going to introduce the notion of leukemia stem cells, other than to say, you know, uh, AML 
is a caricature of normal development. And what happens is that you have, you know, a STEM driving population making the downstream populations. And again, you know, if you sort of stop and think about it, right, if, if tumors are, are, cells are being born every day and cells are dying every day, if I have a cell that's born today and it's dead the week after tomorrow, it's not relevant for that tumor, right? The only cell that's really important to that tumor is the cell that keeps that tumor going uh, and can potentially survive therapy and then, then going to kill the person uh, a few years down the road. So it becomes the ultimate unit of selection for the tumor. And, and if that's true, then the properties of that cell should be more predictive of anything that's important uh, in the tumor. Uh, I mean, but provocative, of course, all the cells play a role, but, but in the context of this the way of setting up the argument, I think, you know, it's a testable hypothesis. So what is it, uh, you know, what could we do? Well, we could mine the gene expression programs to say these are specific for leukemia stem cells compared to any other cell in the leukemia. And we could think about a clinical property that would be most important. And I think it's pretty unarguable that the ultimate, you know, clinical property is whether you're dead or alive. It's a beautiful outcome. It's binary. No, uh, no controversy about uh, classification or anything. And so we ask the question then, can we make a gene expression signature? AML is a diverse disease. We can't just take one or two samples. So we've taken, you know, almost 100 samples. Now, that was, we reported this, but we've taken many more now. We sorted them into different fractions. We did gene expression on all these fractions. But the problem is that we can't say leukemia stem cells are always in this quadrant. They are for some patients, but for some, they're here and here, or here, here, and here, or here and here. In other words, every patient is a little bit different. So we have to go to the trouble of transplanting every one of these fractions into you know, hundreds of mice. Uh, so we could calculate or determine functionally which is a leukemia stem cell fraction and which is not. And at the end of the day, we captured all the mice and all the fractions that were leukemia stem cell negative compared to the ones that were leukemia stem cell positive and came up with, you know, 104 gene differential signature. We ran it against the big bulk uh, Dutch data set, 500 patients, and showed that it was predictive of survival. But we wanted to ask, well, what's the optimal signature? And so Stan... Uh, ran a, uh, a lasso regression, sort of machine learning approach to run these 104 genes. Sorry. And what he found was that there are 17 genes that is optimally predictive of survival. And this is against chemotherapy, right? Uh, and so that was a 500 patient training set, and we tested it against many thousands of patients now. Uh, and it holds up, you know, incredibly well. So remember, it's a 17 gene score. Every gene has a weight. Some have a positive weight, some have a negative weight. You just add up the positive and negative weights and you get a score. So we've actually converted this into a nanostring. Uh, that nanostring is now CLIA certified in our cancer center. This is just an experience on 300 patients. And you can see if you have a high score, you do much more poorly than a low score with standard uh, chemotherapy. Um, the one thing I'll just point out, I don't have it, the data here, but it's in the paper. That's just survival outcome, but if we actually can, right now, right, in our cancer center, uh, if a patient comes in, you know, we need to know clinical uh, history, uh, karyotype, and, uh, you know, a few other features, and, and that's what, you know, the, the, the uh, hematopathology report, and that's what you need in order to predict, is this patient going to be a primary non-responder or not? And ultimately, uh, karyotype is the main driver of that. And in our center, it still takes a week or two, maybe sometimes even more. And so patients are always put on standard therapy, but we could predict response with the signature. It's not shown here, but we can predict primary response uh, in 20, and we can get this data done in, you know, in 24 or 48 hours in a very inexpensive test. Uh, and so I think that, you know, it has a lot of merit uh, and we're trying to implement it, you know, uh, more clinically, more broadly, actually, to try to, you know, get it used in more ways. But I'll just make one other point, and that is, you know, these 300 patients, Yes, there are you know 120 you know target genes in AML, but of course everybody has their own private cancer genome, right? There are mutations in the non-regulatory regions that are playing a role, and so forth. So you know these 300 or these you know thousand or 1500, everybody has their own private way of making a cancer. The fact that a 17 gene signature about whether a human cell can graft a mouse or not can have this level of prediction is crazy, right? It's it's sort of shocking. You know, there's 1,500 ways to make a cancer cell, but they must all coalesce into one process, their impact on stemness. And I would say that there are very few ways for a cell to be a stem cell. And so I think that, you know, it, it, it certainly raises the notion that we need to understand stemness as a therapeutic target 
you know, in a more fundamental way. Because, you know, all the ways you make a, a cancer cell from the surface of the cell to the nucleus, there are many bypass pathways, right? That's why the, you know, the signaling molecules, or, you know, targeting the signaling pathways don't work particularly well uh, in, you know, in AML, even like PLAT3, right? Um, because there's too many redundant pathways. But if stemness is a convergent process, there would be less ways to, to, to escape. So that's my, my, my mantra. Okay, um, you know, how relevant, that was all done in AML, uh, but it turns out that I, this actually works quite well in other kinds of cancers as well. We, we have a big collaborative grant with uh, Peter Dirks who have, works on GBM stem cells. And Peter has identified a variety of, of stem kind of cells in, in GBM. And when we compare our signatures to him, there's, they're very similar um, now. Uh, we've done some work with Catherine O'Brien on colon cancer and their DTP signature is very similar to one of our, our, our dormancy signatures. And this is, this is untrained. Like we can retrain that LSC 17 by just changing the, the learning uh, to a different disease, but this is just trained for AML, but it, you know, really has high prediction for some of these, you know, solid tumors, glioma, for example. So it goes back to my point. I think stemness is convergent, not just in AML, but actually the stemness is convergent across, you know, uh, many solid tumors. So this is what I said. So can we, you know, this is one strategy for finding biomarkers and so forth, but the idea is can we find other ways of understanding AML and better classifying, but also better predicting for what kind of therapy somebody should get. So right now, none of the, none of the biomarkers, you know, yes, if I have flat 3 ITD, maybe I'll be, you know, qualified to be put onto, you know, some of the inhibitors or, uh, you know, IDH1 mutation. But, but then those genomic level are, are, you know, first of all, they're very crude and they only capture a very small proportion of patients. So what we need is a better predictor, particularly for new therapeutics. You know, I think the, the biomarker I showed you is very good for standard chemotherapy, but, you know, it doesn't do anything for, for, for targeted therapeutics. And so the question is, can we learn something about AML through the lens of normal development, right? The lens of normal development is I have STEM and then I have cells that can diversify into all these lineages here. And the question is, how much differentiation actually exists uh, in AML? Uh, and you know, if you just go back to the great you know, hematopathologists of the 19th century looking down a microscope, they could see differences in the granulation, cell size, nuclear morphology of you know, cancer cells. And yes, they're more homogeneous, but you know, not every cancer cell is equal. And so they could help start to grade that way. And you know, the old classification system in AML, the FAB was kind of, on this kind of strategy, right? You have some kinds of tumors that are a little more myelomonocytic or AMKL or so forth, and other ones which are more blastic or more primitive. And if we adopt the idea of a leukemia stem cell, you can think then that there is a hierarchy in the same way, you know, this has a very deep hierarchy, right? There's rare stem cells, one in 100,000, many common mature cells. Uh, you know, the frequency here can change from tumor to tumor, but it, it suggests then that in some cases there's going to be quite a deep hierarchy between some rare leukemia stem cells and some more differentiated, quote unquote, leukemia blasts, and others where there's a shallow hierarchy. Most of the cells are pretty stem like, pretty primitive. So if that's all true, can we characterize that hierarchy on a patient specific basis, right? Can we characterize the shape of the hierarchy, the depth of the hierarchy? Uh, on a patient-specific basis. And so with single-cell strategy, you can begin to do this. And so we were guided by Peter Van Galen's just beautiful work in cell from a few years ago when he was a postdoc with Brad Bernstein. Peter was a student in my lab. He helped to discover the stress pathways in, in, uh, in normal stem cells. And so he did this beautiful work where he compared, uh, uh, he, he did single-cell sequencing on a set of normal samples, and then he did it for a set of patient samples and on uh, samples, and he showed that some samples were very primitive-like, some were more mature, some were more GMP-like, some were intermediate. So it means that the bulk of the cells were stem-like and they didn't persist into any downstream cells. So I'm just showing, I'll show you, I, this is not Peter's projection, this is our projection. So that map I showed you earlier of normal human stem cell atlas, this is projecting one sample onto that atlas and you can see where it lands and how it lands and how restricted it is. So we call these kinds of samples primitive because all the cells in the tumor are like that. And then there's another kind where most of the cells look like this. They don't have a lot of stem cell frequency. They look a lot like a differentiated cell. And then there's the GMP dominant one and there's one which is uh, you know, intermediate. It's more, you know, it has more programs that are active. And so you can do this on a patient by patient basis. 
The problem is we don't have a lot of single cell data out there. And single cell data is hard to do on a large you know, set of patients. What we do have are thousands of patients in biobanks where RNA sequencing has been done, or even array in the earlier time. And can we out capture that information? Well, we can capture it because we can take advantage of you know, pathway or programs like, like deconvolution, right? So just to remind you, deconvolution is like making a smoothie. Every fruit has its own signature. Uh, you make a smoothie and you can, um, you know, reconstruct the smoothie by saying, well, you know, this is, a, you know, 50% uh, apple and 20% uh, strawberry and so forth. And then I know how many strawberries went in just by looking at the bulk smoothie, uh, if I know the signatures. And since we know the signatures of, let's go back, we know the signatures of stem cells, and we know the signatures of GMP and mature, can we deconvolute bulk data sets? And so we uh, brought together data from eight, three data sets from 864 patients. Each one of these lines is a patient. And so you can see, here's a set of patients where uh, those patients have a very strong GMP signature. And so we call them GMP-like. Uh, there's another set here, which is um, you know, more mature myeloid-like. Uh, so you can see, and then there's another one down here, which has a lot of pink, which is a stem cell signature. These are the more primitive ones. Uh, and this is the intermediate one. And these all have different um, features. And we could project these all onto a PCA uh, between primitive to GMP or primitive to mature, and then do all kinds of you know, clinical studies, essentially virtual clinical studies, uh, for example. And so but one of the real questions that we wanted to ask was, if I'm a primitive stem cell like this, and I have this kind of a, uh, you know, th this is what, these are advert, I mean, I'm just showing you real data. So that broadly, that kind of patient in that class, patients up here, tend to do very poorly. They're very adverse. They have these kinds of genotypes. By the way, this is very, just read the paper, but this is really powerful for integrating. We can predict with high accuracy what kind of a genetic perturbation uh, somebody had. Or if we know the genetic perturbation, we know what kind of a hierarchy classification they are. And the GMP dominant ones have a much more favorable uh, outcome. Uh, and, uh, you know, certain set of drivers, uh, mature myeloid are down here. They're sort of in, in, are, you know, a bit more intermediate uh, and, uh, and so forth. So the thing is, different kind of responses to, certain, to current therapy, but do they have different sensitivity to different drugs? And so we had the opportunity to look at the beat AML data. And when they created this program, Beautifully, they not only collected samples and did RNA sequencing, but they also did small drug screens, of short-term drug screens in vitro, about 100 drugs or so. And they had drug response for every patient on a patient-specific basis. So we just deconvoluted and then linked our deconvolution, our hierarchy classification system with drug response. And what came out of it was this data here, which is remarkable, right? So if I have uh, a mature-like leukemia, uh, I'm very sensitive to all of these agents, mostly signaling agents and so forth. I'm completely unresponsive to venetoclax. Alternatively, if I'm a primitive sample here, I'm not sensitive to these guys at all. Uh, and I'm um, very sensitive to venetoclax. So, you know, hierarchy classification is able to predict, you know, outcome against, you know, uh, good drugs. And so we actually collected public data that was available. This is mostly uh, 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 cell line data that had gene expression associated with it. And so we could begin to ask how well are these, um, 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 how are, well are these determinants at capturing the prediction of drug response? And so, you know, there's a lot of drugs that it's actually capturing, um, you know, whether you're either primitive or mature. Uh, whereas it's interesting, this axis here is not very good at capturing drug response. It's actually this primitive to mature axis, which is capturing it. Okay, so that is in the paper published in the Nature Medicine paper. Where are we now? Well, so we have, you know, what do we have? We have hierarchy classification on a patient-specific basis. We have gene expression on a patient-specific basis, right, which is, we, we create this from gene expression, but we have gene expression on every patient. It's like an independent data set. And then we actually have methylation on about 300 of these samples. And so what we're going to do is put this all together into a network to try to extract more granularity out of this. It becomes a you know, computational challenge. We're lucky to be able to collaborate with Bo Wang and Anna Goldenberg, who developed similarity network fusion, which is, I think, the leading uh, sort of approach to try to create networks from data like this. And Bo has uh, developed this SNF2, which allows inequ inequ inequities of data. In other words, you 
originally you had to have equal amounts of data when you're trying to fuse together, uh, but he actually now can allow this um, is inequity here. And so we've been able to create a network uh, of all this data, and, and I'll just show you one summary of this. Oops. So this, you know, I told you we used to have four categories, primitive, GMP, et cetera. Now we have 12 categories. So much more granularity uh, by fusing all this data together. So these are the different classes nominally named at the top, but you can see this is how, you know, this is why they're classified this way. The transcriptome is this way, they change. Uh, you know, here, genotypes are, are very specific. You know, these have these kinds of, you know, variants, these have these and so on and so forth. Um, and you can, you know, you can, uh, uh, you know, cluster around biological processes. So a lot of information that you can capture from this data, including drug response. So, you know, much more finely graded view uh, of, um, of um, a targeted therapy. So this is a strategy we want to go forward on. Um, I think, I mean, I can, I can show three or four more slides at the end just to make another point, but I'm also, I think you said to maybe talk for 45 minutes or you want me to go a little more? Okay. So we, um, you know, so, so I've told you about pre-leukemia, uh, might start a decade or more earlier in an adult uh, based on the data we have from the EPIC study. Uh, we have a lot of studies from us and others on cholinemopoiesis and how it is the middle point, if you like, between um, a normal hematopoietic system and leukemia. And that's all well and fine for adult disease, but of course, children get leukemia too. And we know from the you know, pioneering work of Mel Graves that if you're a child with leukemia, invariably that leukemia will have started when you're in utero. And uh, you know, you did pioneering twin studies and then cord blood sampling and so forth. And so all the critical events, the normal cell is a fetal cell, not an adult stem cell. Uh, the pre-leukemic expansion happens, and we know that for, for one particular case, which, which uh, I'll tell you about. And then, of course, a little later on, the leukemia. So how do we model that, right? How are we going to understand it, right? We can take now, you know, we can take cord blood cells or adult cells. We can knock in CRISPR edit various genes and, you know, begin to work out pathways of and mechanisms of oncogenesis. But how are we going to do this in the fetal setting? Uh, and so we turned our attention to Down syndrome. And Down syndrome is an interesting one, right? So we know what some of the genetic lesions are, right? We know that it all starts with trisomy 21. Uh, there's something potentiating about having an extra chromosome. Uh, we know that 30% of these patients will be born with leukemia or develop it shortly after birth, but it's a transient leukemia. It'll last for a period of time and it goes away, sometimes by itself. Sometimes it needs a little bit of therapy, but it, it's a transient leukemia. We know from sequencing that that is formed by a particular mutation in the GATA1 gene that changes the splice form and you only get the short form of GATA1S being uh, produced. Uh, and then about a quarter of those patients will go on and get the leukemia, but a very unique kind, AMKL, acute medicoidoblastic leukemia. And uh, that typically is caused by uh, several genes, but mostly the cohesin genes. Uh, so we know something about it, but we don't know anything about the order or the sequence. And, you know, again, Downs is not a very, you know, none of the Downs models, most models, replicate the human disease precisely. And so uh, we wanted to do this in the human setting. And so I'm just summarizing, you know, one, uh, uh, this paper in science. But essentially what we did is we CRISPR edited very efficiently, you know, 90% Elvin had developed a beautifully efficient um, uh, method for doing even at the level of single, single long-term hematopoietic stem cells. Uh, for CRISPR editing. So we would CRISPR edit uh, the GATA1S uh, into a trisomy 21 or a normal but diastolemic fetal liver. And then we would transplant it to mice. We would ask, when would we get leukemia, pre-leukemia? And it had all the features of pre-leukemia. It grew like a leukemia. It had all the uh, cellular features just of the human disease, actually, but it didn't serially transplant. It didn't propagate. So it was, it was a, 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 a defined period of growth. It only ever happened if we CRISPR edited it into the trisomy 21, we never got a, a pre-leukemia if we went into a normal uh, fetal liver. And then we sorted various populations and we only ever got pre-leukemia in every case. If we CRISPR edited the long-term hematopoietic stem cell, we never got it with a short term or an MPP or anything downstream. So highly contextual initiation of this process. Then we did, we CRISPR edited both genes, uh, the uh, 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 STAG and, uh, and the GATA1S, and, um, and asked, when do we get leukemia? Well, now there was no context. You could get a full-blown, serially passageable disease, 
by doing either normal fetal liver or trisomy 21. Uh, you could do it into almost any progenitor. Uh, you know, we went down to CMP, GMP. They would all give you uh, a leukemia, a frank leukemia. So what we infer from this is that, you know, the sequence of events is very narrow. There's something that trisomy 21 does to potentiate the first steps and into why you get this expansion of, of, of trisomy, uh, of GATA1S, uh, but it can only happen in a stem cell. Just parenthetically, we had, we, we actually did all this work and why we studied this was, Eric Lechman, we've been looking at microRNAs that had identified a set of leukemia-specific microRNAs, had a couple of papers on that, uh, and we've been looking at targets and how they function and so forth, but he realized that out of the top 10 uh, microRNAs that were leukemia stem cell specific, three of them mapped onto chromosome 21. And so we had already been thinking about what their role they're playing. And so we actually, CRISPR edited out that locus and basically prevented pre-leukemia from happening. And if we overexpressed that uh, uh, set of microRNAs, we could accelerate the, um, the production of pre-leukemia. So, you know, we don't know what it is on 21 that actually is playing a role. People in the field actually don't know particularly well. But I think that the, at, we know at the very least these microRNAs are playing some role uh, in this process. But the part that is going to be interesting, and that's what I wanted to show you here, is this. And so we asked the question, uh, does, does, does age matter, right? This is fetal. We know that, you know, often the, you know, uh, pediatric diseases are different than adult diseases, right? I mean, BLL is very common in children, has a set of drivers. BLL is not so common in adults and has a different kind of drivers, right? And there are a number of diseases that are different between adult and, and, and pediatric. And the question is, does this have to do with the cell of origin? And so uh, I, I want to bet. So the other guys said, for sure, this is so potent, it's going to work across the whole spectrum. Uh, and uh, we bet a bottle of wine. So I've got two really, really good bottles of wine because uh, I won this bet. I said, I think it's going to be a developmental restriction. So just what we did is, this is just knocking in uh, these two genes into either normal fetal liver. And if you look at this bar, this is just, these are the leukemia blasts that we're monitoring. And the leukemia blasts are present when we do normal fetal liver. Uh, they're present, so we get the disease. Uh, this is full-blown disease. Uh, when we uh, transplant, or when we uh, knock it into the combo into the cord blood, we never get it with adult bone marrow. So there's something contextual about these. And so we're spending a lot of effort now to carry out deep multi-ohm analysis on the fetal liver and of course the adult side to really try to understand what is it about the states of these cells that might explain why there might be differences in these different uh, sort of uh, stages. So thank you. I think I've gone a little bit over time, uh, but uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, I think I've named the people in the, in the uh, uh, this last book I should say was done by uh, Elvin Wagonblast, who's just started at Mount Sinai in New York. Uh, Eric Blackman, who has just moved to the University of Pittsburgh uh, Cancer Center. Uh, and uh, Joanna, Ar Joanna Arraio, who's uh, uh, an MD, PhD in uh, Portugal. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John, for this wonderful lecture. So, before giving the uh, time for the attendees, so a lot of this is very simple question. So a lot of this study has been done at the moment of diagnosis of the leukemia. Later, in the, because many of them respond to therapy, there is a relapse. How this changed? Have you analyzed in the relapse all these signatures what happened there? So, <clears throat> I mean, we have not, we haven't looked at, like, you mean the HSC signature? Yeah. So we haven't looked in that context. So we actually haven't looked, we have not looked carefully, other than that very first slide I showed you, or one, for one of the slides I showed you, where we've, we've mapped the HSC memory signature into a set of AMLs, and it looks like it's highly enriched in one subclass if they have ASXL uh, mutations. Uh, but beyond that, we haven't really done any analysis. We haven't actually looked. We have, a, we have some data on relapse samples uh, that, were, that was in the paper, but we can now, it's about 50 or so relapse samples. Uh, we, have to, we haven't looked yet on that, so, so I don't know. Thank you very much. Questions? Hi. That was amazing. Uh, so I, I, I have... I was wondering if you could expand a little bit on the, I was very excited by, by the data that you showed. 
where if I remember correctly, you ha you separated uh, from the patients with AML, individual the the blast with the DNA three mutations and the ones without or something like that, mm -hmm. and they both showed the same gene expression patterns. And yeah, said, I know. <laughs> chicken or egg. Then yeah, we they go, show the same. They show the HSC memory. Yeah. So th and then we go to the fetal liver, bone marrow, leukemia. So so. Is it the context of the, you know, is it where the cells belong or is it the mutations? What do you think? I mean, <clears throat> so if we think about, you know, if we think about the, you know, the beautiful work that the Sanger groups are, are doing, uh, formally speaking, it's possible. So, so yes, they can see that there is an HSC which has the three mutation or a tattoo mutation and there's a wild type there. But what we don't know is actually maybe there had been a clonal expansion already. And, and so let's just say that uh, HSC memory stem cells go up in you and I as we age. And at some point in time, you know, one of that pool will pick up a CH mutation and the other one will be wild type, but they're growing out of a, a, a natural change in the blood system that happens uh, as we age. Now, why is that happening uh, in a, in a, in a and somebody who's aging well you know we all are exposed to inflammatory processes right and it's possible that it's the combination of all the things that we've exposed over the course of our 70 years that uh, you know is, is sort of invariably allowing this to happen and then it just happens one of those picks up a ch mutation and the other one doesn't but they all are coming out of a, a discrete population so that's one hypothesis the other hypothesis is that you know there was a so one hypothesis is that uh, the, 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 the CH mutation is arising in one of these stem cells. These CH mutations are causing an inflammatory process, right? We know that TET will cause an inflammatory you know, outcome. And that is uh, a, a exposing the other stem cells in that person to that inflammation. And now we're seeing sort of the outgrowth of, of this HSC memory. So, uh, and, then, and then I guess the third would be that, uh, you know, there is, uh, you know, there, there is some kind of a generalized uh, inflammatory process. But, so, you know, I'm waving my hands. I, what, I'm not betting against you because I, I don't want to lose. But where would you put your money? <laughs> yeah, where am I going to put my money? That's a good, that's a very good question. Um, I, 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 I think I'm biasing myself a little bit more to the idea that we probably have a larger pool of HSC memory around the same time that we're picking up our, you know, our, our CH mutations. Now, the one thing that we'll argue just against what I just said is that there are cases, you know, Lisa Lorente just reported something at the meeting, you know, yesterday, uh, where they can see, you know, a patient with CH where they picked up their 3A mutation in, you know, I think in, in fetal life. Uh, so, you know, uh, I think all bets are off uh, in terms of uh, some, you know, we know from again, some of the work being done that some of these, you know, myeloproliferative neoplasms diagnosed at somebody who's 40 started when the person was 10, you know, the first jack mutation or something. So, you know, our, our, our conception of what's happening in the blood system, I think, is, is being challenged by all this new technology. And so everything I'm saying is a, is a bit uh, tentative, let's say. Thank you very much for the talk, it was amazing. I was just wondering whether you had the chance to check in pediatric bone marrow, because we are always looking at core blood, adult, but what about pediatric? So uh, we, we've been doing, so we've been doing this hierarchy classification on a large, so we have a large collaboration with Charles Mulligan. Uh, they have a set of 90 samples where they have single cell sequencing. And they also have a much larger set of I don't know, 200 or something like that, uh, where they have sequencing. And so we can do deconvolution. So uh, broadly, uh, we can classify BALL uh, into, I think, uh, classifications based on how similar or different they are to B cell development. Uh, you know, in, in, a, in a similar sort of way as we have in AML. Um, and I think that some of those classifications are going to be meaningful. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's, we're still putting the data together, uh, but uh, so from, from that standpoint, I think that uh, this, this notion of, you, of, of looking at the disease 
through the lens of normal development, I think is going to be will work quite well in pediatric disease. The one thing I will say is that actually in Andy's paper, we have looked at pediatric AML and this, so there's two things. One is that, as you know, pediatric AML is almost a separate disease from adult AML, right? The drivers are different and so forth. But when the big, when the group, uh, Maninchi and, and others reported on the first uh, data sets, they had actually ran our LSC-17 uh, on that data set. And it was the only adult derived signature that actually worked in, in pediatric disease. Uh, so, and, um, and so we've, we've run this hierarchical classification, uh, you know, into pediatric disease, and it actually works really, really well um, in, in, in pediatric disease. And would you say that it is closer to, like the, the signatures would be closer to Gorblat or to adult bone marrow? I know it's a difficult question, but we are always with this gap about the pediatric data yeah. that is kind of a, um, when we work in pediatric cases. Yeah, you know, I, I, I think that, I, I, you know, we, we, we probably haven't analyzed our data in a way that I can answer it really precisely, but what I can tell you is, if we look at our fetal map, our cord blood map, <clears throat> and our adult map, cord and adult are probably closer together than cord and fetal. Okay, okay. Um, so I think that that is, uh, is, is, is true. You know, and, and if you actually look back at the paper, so we had a, a paper, you know, our, one of the original papers we had on, on uh, examining the hierarchy in AML, or the hierarchy in, in, in human blood development, a 2016 paper in science. So we did a lot of that work with cord blood, so single cell functional studies, looking at output and, you know, uh, hierarchy analysis. Uh, even there, we already showed functionally there's a difference between cord and fetal in terms of the, um, the you know, well, actually, the, the, you're just right here, so I, <laughs> my slide is up. So, you know, we, this is all based on single cell functional studies asking how many, uh, uh, what, what the readout is. And what that data clearly showed was that CMP is an artifact, right? CMP is just a heterogeneous population. And it, with a set of markers, you can you can break apart CMP into, you know, unilineage uh, outputs of you know erythroid, megakaryocytic, uh, and myeloid outcome, and that's how we that's why we came up to this two tier classification. The only multipotential cells are stem like cells, and the rest are all unilineage. But that's all starting with cord blood, uh, whereas fetal liver has more plasticity. There's more multipotentiality through the hierarchy. So even then, but and now we have more gene expression differences. Anyways. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation. And um, I was wondering how much of the hierarchy is actually maintained when you use hematopoietic stem cells or leukemic stem cells of patients um, in a xenograft model? Like, is this hierarchy somewhat maintained, or uh, do you see in the same type of driver mutations and passive mutations, or is this? Uh, uh, sorry, are you talking about leukemia and pre-leukemia or, or normal? Uh, okay. And okay, so I can I can ask I can answer it this way. So in general, uh, certainly at the top end of the hierarchy, the uh, you know the the phenotype, uh, the gene expression, and so forth is actually quite well maintained in the xenograft. So if we, you know, remember these are pretty rare cells. So the way we would do this experiment is, uh, you know, we would transplant mice. We would wait for 20, 24 weeks, something like that. And then we would have cohorts of mice, maybe, you know, take at least five mice, pool uh, all the bone marrow from that mouse. We take a lot of bone marrow from the mouse, uh, extract the, we purify out the murine cells uh, and purify out the mature uh, human cells. And then we retain just the primitive cells. And then, then we can do our phenotypic analysis. There's enough events, but you have to pool um, and it's highly consistent, but not downstream, right? So, you know, you don't get, it's not, a, it's not a mini human walking around, right? We don't get red cell production and so forth. I mean, the newer mice, you know, the cytokine driven mice, we get much more myelopoiesis. Sometimes you get a little bit more, you know, sort of megakaryocytic, a little bit more platelets and things like that, but you don't get normal development. With respect to leukemia is an interesting one. So what happens is that when we were, if you have a leukemia, uh, if you have a leukemia sample uh, in general, the cells that grow in the mice are the cells that have some kind of a competitive growth advantage. 
And one of the one of the I mean one of the papers that we published in 2017 in, in, in Nature where we had looked at diagnosis relapse, we did a lot of xenografting. And what was really interesting is that we could there was a, a person walks into the clinic, they have a dominant clone. Um, if they relapse, the relapse is often coming from a minor clone, but that minor clone is present the day they walked into the clinic. Now it's lying buried in in some cases in a one in a million cell. We only saw it because we could purify, and then we map back relapse specific variants and showed the presence of the variant. But when we take that leukemia sample, right, there's a big load of leukemia, we transplant it into our mice, what actually grew out was the relapse fated cells, the cells that were already eventually going to, you know, kill the person later on. So there's something about the environment of the, of the xenograft, which is actually reading out the more aggressive cells. We've actually seen the same thing in, in BALL as well. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's a, a positive and a negative, of course. I mean, we could always get the other clone to grow it. It just has to do with how many cells you transplant and, and other things. But in general, the more aggressive clones are the ones that read out in the mouse. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Hi. Yeah, here. Yeah, yeah thanks for the talk. It was great. Um, so something I didn't fully understand is when you look at the hierarchies, uh, so you deconvolute RNA seq data, you find these groups of mature like, primitive like, GMP like. So, how does it fit with the signature of leukemic stem cells? So, do I have to imagine that the primitive like or have the leukemic stem cells and mature don't? So, do the mature ones follow the. Sorry. Yeah, so, so what's interesting, I'm going to just quickly show you the slides. It makes it more, probably explains it a little bit better. So if you look at this, okay, yeah. So if you look at this axis, if I were to run LSE 17 and I want to do a correlation, LSE 17 will be high here and it'll be low here. It doesn't pick up this axis. And, and so it's fine for uh, the predictions that come from this axis, but you can see most of the drug development that axis doesn't, it's very, it's fine for prognosis, but it's not very good for predicting drug response. It's this axis, which actually predicts drug response. And, and, and this is, it's not that it's anti-correlated, it's just not correlated as highly. So it's not just stemness, right? So if I'm just doing stemness, LC17 is fine. It's high up in here, but there's something about the difference between this kind of cell and this differentiation sort of axis which is what's capturing the drug response component. So, uh, yeah, so, it, so, so the, you know, which is, so what that means, another way to say that is the LSC 17 has no ability to do this. this if I were to do, run LS 17, it would be like this, it would have no predictive power. For, it will for standard chemotherapy, but it won't for these targeted drugs. Okay, uh, in the interest of time, we should finish here. Thank you very much.